All right, so let me talk a little bit about this transformation first from a data standpoint and then what we're doing to help. So as you think about what I just showed you in the five-step process, it's important to keep in mind that, yes, it starts with data, but please focus on the North Star. Ultimately, what you're trying to do is not to have data for data's sake. You are trying to understand your customers and prospects completely and in an actionable way. And you also want to understand those connections, especially in the B2B space. You want to understand how entities are connected. For us, as we look at our goals of our investment, it's about doing two things. Number one, to help you establish that transparency, to understand that complete and actionable view. So as I show you what we're doing and what we're focusing on, it's about accomplishing that first. But then the second component is turning insight into action is increasingly about foresight. The winning hand in a competitive market with all the pressures we're facing is can you anticipate and act upon your customer needs before they materialize? Now that sounds absolutely crazy, but I'm telling you customers are doing this. Companies are pushing the envelope. They're called customer management actions and lead management actions. The ability to anticipate your customers' needs and behaviors can now be enabled by the environment we're in. So my past life in financial services, we were able to identify a customer that had changing needs in life insurance and homeowner's insurance and so on before they ever even thought about it. Why? Because we were able to see what was happening in their life elsewhere. They were moving, they had a child, other trigger events informed us. We can do the same thing in the B2B space. Let me just be crystal clear. We can do the same thing in the B2B space. We can get to the point of anticipating those customer needs. What does that do for your sales force? What does that do for your product development activities? What does that do for your customer care organization? That's where art and science comes together. And it's a very powerful activity. So what's our roadmap all about? Our roadmap is to do this, to help you see your relationships, know there's relationships, predict their behavior, and act upon that information. How we're doing this is we're focused on three things. It does start with data. It does start with predictive insights. In some cases, it starts with getting the foundation and the fundamentals right. Second thing we continue to focus on is identity resolution and our assets around what we call global identity. The ability to see and understand an entity, who they are and what they are. And then the last piece for us is the investment we're making in analytics. That's our commitment to all of you to provide you insight and foresight. And to your question, in an increasingly holistic way. That's what we have to do. Now, by the way, I'm not anticipating I'll get a round of applause for the investment today. And I'm not asking for one. Because that's what we should do to help you on this journey so you can optimize your business decisions. That was the requirement I had prior to joining the company, was that we were going to up our game. Because against this backdrop, when you're trying to put all these pieces of the puzzle together, we have to do our part. So what are we doing? Well, there are 21 markets topping our list. Doesn't mean we're ignoring the rest of the world. We continue to cover the other 200 plus 210 or so. But these 21 markets are markets that are critically important to us. They account for about 90% of global commerce. We are making substantial investments in terms of what we call depth of data, which is data and, and predictive insight, and then what we're doing in terms of analytics going along with it. Phase one has a dozen markets, which are top of mind. Phase two has another nine. And I'm hoping when you look at that list of 21, you say that feels about right. Those are where my critically important business decisions are. Thumbs up? Yes, we get the occasional questions on South Africa, and we get the occasional questions on Argentina, and so on. And we have initiatives underway in those countries as well. But our goal against these 21 markets is to achieve a point of arrival that's comparable to our capabilities in developed markets, which is a very bold statement, given the fact that if you look at this list, it includes emerging markets like China, Indonesia, Vietnam, India, which have historically been problematic. So what we're doing going down this focus in terms of Europe is starting off with the 12 up top. 
or point of arrival are all of the traditional capabilities you would assume, plus what we're doing in predictive insights and analytics. In our additional focus markets, which would include the Benelux countries and Ireland and Turkey, it's about establishing not only those foundational capabilities, but start to build all the predictive insights that go along with it, and then we'll find some organic opportunities in the rest of Europe. What we're very excited about is that both in bucket one and bucket two, this is allowing us to bring insights to you that we believe are actionable. I'm going to show you a few things today, such as the viability rating, but we're also doing things in terms of global analytics that we believe will help you make better decisions as well. And interestingly enough, out of the gate, we're pushing very hard on Benelux countries to augment what we're doing in France and Germany and the UK to provide you those insights from a decision-making standpoint as well. All right, so here's the fun. Let's first talk about data. So what's our commitment on the data front? Our commitment on the data front is to do three things. Number one, we're continuing to strengthen our core capabilities. I'll show you where we're at today. I'm going to be completely transparent. As I like to say, there's a famous US movie called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Our goal is to get as much good and to get rid of the bads and the uglies. But as we all know, there are required investments that had to make because we had gaps. So our commitment on the foundational side is to do the traditional things really well, such as identity data, firmographics data, but it's also about moving to new data sources, new methods, new ways of solving those traditional business problems. Second thing we're doing is we are now capturing, for the first time, a variety of proprietary assets that DNB has. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about signals. What's so exciting coming into DNB is that we have within our own capabilities the ability to track and monitor a variety of measures on business health on a real-time basis. Guess what we're finding? Changes in those measures are very insightful about future business behavior. Very insightful. We like to use the analogy of what my right hand, Anthony, talks about all the time. Anthony, besides running my global data and predictive insight organization, also volunteers as an EMT. So the renaissance man he is always likes to remind us about how best-in-class medical practitioners behave. Well, they don't just check your pulse. They check a variety of things. Respiration, pupil dilation, blood pressure, maybe samples, and so on. But the most powerful thing to do is track it over a period of time. If you've ever been in the hospital, why do they track it regularly? Because they're looking for changes. Guess what we're now doing? We're capturing, organizing, and making sense of those signals and those changes. How powerful can that be for you in terms of your decisioning? The ability to understand those changes and what it means for future business behavior and their responsiveness to the interactions you may have. And then the third piece of the puzzle is we're bringing in other new relationships. Shipment data, logistics data, online data, B2B commerce data, you name it. So we like to say we are data agnostic. We have an R&D factory testing ideas continuously. We've got about 120 in the pipeline right now that we're just testing and evaluating to determine whether or not it will provide us a better view of your commercial relationships and greater insights from a predictiveness standpoint. Our ultimate goal is to give you this actionable view. And so our commitment is there just to give you a quick scorecard on what we're doing. First, on the foundational side, we're not doing things just the way we've always done, and that is go acquire more ID data. We're using analytics to determine gaps in our data, revamping our quality processes, or readapting our issues management activities. We're also leveraging our new data sources, as I'll talk about in a moment, not just for signals, but our new data sources can help us with some traditional things like firmographic data. Why do you care about firmographic data? Well, if you know the size and the age of a business, that's usually the first way you segment your commercial relationships. We have to address those issues clearly. Now, where's the journey at right now in the key European markets? Well, a quick snapshot just to set this up, foundational data and then firmographic data. Where were we in 2012 when we began? Where are we in 2013 and how do we feel about 2014? Our goal state is to be green, green, green. By the way, that means 90% accurate on ID and 60 to 80% on firmographic data. Which of, this is of the active universe. If you look at it in terms of the universe of interest, the records you really care about, 
it's much higher than that, and I'll give you a snapshot of that in a moment. This is against every record in the active universe, so it's a very aggressive target. Progress underway clearly, for instance, in the UK, where we started our investments in Europe. We feel very good about the path we're on in the Benelux countries, and with our partners in France and our partners in Germany, we're moving forward with improving our capabilities in those markets as well. Beyond the foundational activities, we're very focused on our predictive insights and our analytic solutions as well. Again, our commitment here is to have accounts receivable data or proxies for over 30% of our active records, for having financial statements or proxies for over 20% of our records, and then building analytic solutions, including the viability rating for those entities in those markets. Again, pretty good snapshot in terms of where we're going to be in terms of green. Still some gaps that we have to fill in that we're working on, some of which will be covered in the second phase. Having said that, by the end of 2014, given how ambitious we are, I believe we're going to have the bulk of Europe very close to point of arrival with regards to predictive insights and the analytic solutions that go along with it. Now to do this well, we have to continue to adapt our strategy. We know that. I mentioned that we're leveraging third-party data sources. We've got a lot going on. This just gives you some sense of the data sources we're testing today and bringing into our environment. Our goal is to, once again, do whatever we can to provide you transparency and predictive insights. And we test anything. If you guys have ideas about new data sources, please let us know. All good ideas warmly received. I'm not exactly sure where this journey is going to take us, other than it's going to be very aggressive going forward. Why? Because it should be. The data and the data sources that are available to us today are more plentiful than ever. And we at DNB have to take advantage of that. We also have to take advantage of our proprietary assets, such as signal data. And I am thrilled with where we're at in key markets like the UK and our ability to leverage these assets. These are simple measures in terms of activity, and we're collecting them through a variety of sources. What I love about these signals is that not only can they serve as proxies for traditional data sources, but they're highly insightful about what's happening with the business. So let me just give you some sense. I want to bounce ahead one slide, give you some sense of how this looks, for instance, in the UK. We looked at signals and business viability. That is, viability by our definition is, is this business going to be active a year from now. And not surprisingly, by having our fingers on the pulse, the ability to predict the fact that this business will go inactive is very, very high. Now, why is that powerful? Does that affect your credit decisioning? Does it affect how you should sell and market to a business? Does that affect whether or not you should have them in your supply chain? All of those things are clearly beneficial. For the first time, this is going to allow us to augment the traditional measures like delinquency or traditional other measures such as using firmographic data to get to this complete and actionable view of our customer relationships that you care about. So it's fun for us. I also want to point out that we're measuring our progress across three dimensions. So our progress is I see you, I know you, and I can predict your future behavior. I want you to hold us accountable for this measure. Every active record in these markets, we are going to give you our level of depth of data on. How much in the way of data and insight does DNB have on that individual record? If we have basic identity data, it's going to be in this bucket. If we've got more than basic identity data, it will move into that second bucket we call decision support. And if we have deep, rich files with predictive insights, it'll move up into the highest bucket. Make that available to you in all of those markets. For instance, if you look at the active universe today, that's how it looks. In the UK, we're the highest, almost 50% being in the robust predictive bucket. If you look at the universe of interest, these are the, the records that our customers inquire about and we get interest about, and there's been activity around. The numbers are even better. But please, hold us accountable for this. Our goal state is to give you as many records as possible with deep, rich, predictive insights. So that's our journey on the data side. Very briefly, I want to remind everybody of our commitment on what we're doing in terms of identity resolution. You know, it is a crazy world for us, and just to give you a perspective coming in from the outside, 
I look at the opportunities on the data side as, as being overwhelming. But think about how overwhelming it is if you can't take unstructured data and information and make sense of it. So our investment strategy continues to be wrapped around what we call identity resolution, the ability to take data and information and correctly associate it with a business entity. Now again, you, you think that that's easy. It's not. It's not for all the historic reasons, but it's also not because of the world we're living in today. Things such as businesses being started up. It's a fascinating challenge for anybody. These fly-by-night businesses, I'm trying to remember the one in the UK. Box Park, the one in the UK, which will set you up overnight and tear you down overnight. In the US, we have this entity called Halloween USA that miraculously pops up around September 15th, and then on November 1st, they go away. H&R Block, tax reporting, all those things are tax accounting. You've got this challenge in terms of the ability to correctly deal with translation issues. This, for those of you in the back of the room, this is a good one. Please flash the toilet after you've used it. So much for translation. Our commitment is to acquire data and information in native language and correctly associate it with entities that are in those markets. So we've made substantial investments in all three major Asian languages including Korean, which we launched this year, and our ability to acquire that information and make sure that we are correctly associating it. And then, of course, you get the fun part of unstructured data, which Anthony pulled this bag from a shopping center in Japan, and you would think that this bag is just a bag. It contains all sorts of powerful information, if you can make sense of it, size of the brand, whether or not the brand is in native language or has been translated into a Roman language. The colors on the brand. Think about if you had this over time, what it would be telling you. That's the world we live in. And the opportunities for us to acquire that information and make sense of it have never been greater. So our commitment in terms of identity resolution remains unchanged. We are making investments so we can acquire information irrespective of how that information is becoming available to us. We are also bringing forth new capabilities from a consultative standpoint that if you're having challenges getting to a single view, if you're having challenges getting to a customer identifier, if you're having challenges with your legacy systems, if you're having challenges with any of those issues, we're here to help. All right, the last piece of the journey is what we're doing on the analytic front. And I wanted to touch upon a few issues here. If you go back to my remarks about how you win in this environment, it's about turning data into insight and insight into action. For us, the ability to help you have that foresight has been critically important and has been a big part of our investment. And we're doing it through a number of different ways. One way we're doing it is bringing forth consistent global analytic solutions that you can use to make better decisions. Our historic strength was around things such as failure scores and our emerging markets, EMMA scores. We're still launching and developing those scores in 2014. But what's exciting for us is a consistent delinquency score in markets. Do you pay on time? And secondly, bringing forth the first multidimensional solution we call viability. For us, there is a step process that you go through to help understand an individual market. You go through profiling information to an EMMA score, to a failure score, to the delinquency score, to ultimately, we believe, viability. And then, for many of our customers, customer anal custom analytics on top of that. What are we doing and how are we doing this? Well, that's our timeline we're rolling through right now in terms of failure. The commitment for us is bringing out new failure scores in these key markets in the first quarter, building upon what we did last year. What I'm very excited about is we are getting very good predictive lift. So if you look at business failures captured in the worst 10% and the overall performance lift we're getting in the UK, the Netherlands, Belgium, and alike, this is our foundational commitment to you. We have to do this right. Very good performance. Now, having said that, that's not enough. Insight into action. Holistic point of view. So last year, we developed a new analytic solution called the viability rating. And let me just set this up for you very simply in terms of what it is supposed to do. The viability rating is about a multi-dimensional solution that's probably best seen not by a word chart, but seen by this slide. Four components. 
Is the business likely to be active a year from now? How does the business shake up versus similar businesses? So comparing a small business to a large business doesn't make a lot of sense. So we're providing you the second dimension where you see the number seven, like-sized businesses to like-sized businesses. Third dimension, equally as important, for the first time on every active record, we are going to show you the depth of insight we have on that record. If it's an A, B, or C, it means D and B has deep, rich, predictive insights. If it's a G, it's a pretty thin record. If it's an H or lower, there's something special that you should pay attention to on that record. What I love about this particular solution and what we're doing is its ability to help you carve up your universe, segment your universe with greater precision and timeliness. That's what it's all about. And guess what? We have customers using this to improve their collection prioritization, to anticipate write-offs, to improve their sales and marketing targeting, whether it's knockout rates or pre-screening, improve their direct marketing activities. Because ultimately for you, to that earlier comment, what you need is the ability to have a holistic view of your commercial relationships and anticipate their future needs. Well, guess what? If DNB is saying this business has a higher risk of being inactive, that's an insight in terms of your decisioning. If DNB has deep, rich, predictive insights on that entity, guess what? They tend to be more responsive to sales and marketing overtures especially when you segment them versus like-sized businesses. So our commitment to do what we're supposed to do is right there. It's about segmentation. It's about precision. It's about addressing latency issues. Where we're going next is to bring out the viability rating in the UK. This is an early snapshot. And if you compare it versus the failure rating, it's a very interesting comparison. The failure rating tends to be a more coarse rating, has a very rare event. It's trying to predict, will you technically fail, look at the separation you get on viability between the worst deciles to the best deciles. Rolling this out in the US, our highest deciles told you there was a 45% probability that that entity would not be in business a year from now in some of those deciles versus less than 1% in our best deciles. That's why we're doing it. So that's part of the fun. We're not done there yet. We believe that outside the 21 markets, we also have to provide you risk dynamics. So we are rebuilding our global risk score. Many of you have at least been familiar with an analytic solution we call our supplier risk score, our SSI score. Anybody familiar with SSI? A couple of you. You know, the problem with, with SSI and the way it's been approached globally is that it was a pretty crude analytic solution. And so our commitment is to rebuild and give a global risk score which will be applied against all 138 million active businesses we track. You can maybe applause on that one, but I'm just kidding. But um, it's a big commitment for us. So while we're focused on our 21 markets and bringing out new analytic solutions that give you a more holistic view like viability, we are committed across all 138 million active records to give you the best risk profile analytic we can bring forward. Now we realize this isn't easy, and we're gonna have to build different models to deal with our depth of data and the solutions we can bring forward. But our commitment is to do just that against these four lenses. So records with robust predictiveness, we'll be able to segment with more precision, decision support, and so on. We're also going to bring in our macroeconomic analytic capabilities systematically for the first time. So in some countries around the world, think Yemen, we may not have on all of those records even foundational data. We're at least going to give you a risk factor that takes into account our macroeconomic perspective. So not only are we focused on analytic solutions and developed markets in our 21, but it's about bringing this forward. All right, and then wrapping this all up, we're doing a lot of things on the custom analytics side to help. One thing I'd point out to many of you is this transparency issue. So we are now, and we have built capabilities that will give you transparency in your supply chain, your supplier, supplier, supplier. And then the ability to assess the risk of your tier one supplier by assessing the risk in your tier two and tier three suppliers. If that sounds ambitious, it is. But again, it's part of our commitment of transparency and foresight that you need. You're probably looking over on the right at this crazy idea where we've been working on called material change. 
If any of you are thinking about doing things on the wild, ragged edge, please talk to me about it. We're just now rolling this out in the US. This is an advanced early warning system. We're going to be able to tell when a company that's a caterpillar today, 12 months from now, is going to become a butterfly. Or is a butterfly today and is going to go back into the cocoon. It's out there. It's a little crazy. It's never been done in the B2B world. But we're, we're doing it, and we're going to roll it out into other markets. We'll have to see if we come to the UK next. So for the sake of time, let me bring this full circle by wrapping up on a few other thoughts. We're not done in terms of our overall commitment to help you. The challenge is the operating environment necessitates us to continue to up our game. Our customers are focused on art and science increasingly. We have to be committed to helping you solve those equations. And I'm not here to tell you it's easy, because it's not easy. But more and more companies are going to struggle to leverage fully. To do this right, those five work streams I talked about are critically important. And we are focused on helping you through our global investments navigate. Now, a few concluding thoughts just to bring this all together. Where is this all going to go? On the analytics side, these are all the things we're playing around with. Why? Because we'd like to play. No, because if you think about our customer needs, complex world, global world, disruptive world, they need better insights. So our commitment has to be to continue to play in all of these use cases and dimensions. If you have particular needs against any of those dimensions, please talk to us. Our custom analytics organization can help you navigate those waters. And then the last thing I'll leave you with before taking questions is just to challenge you to think about where this is going next. 30 years into this, I wouldn't have thought 30 years ago we'd be anywhere near where we're at today. The world is complex. But the ability to make sense of a complex world is greater than it's ever been. That's the good news. The question, I think, for all of us, whether or not we're going to be able to fully harness the opportunities and the potential that 40 years of transformation allows us to harness. I think the great companies are going to do it. I think companies that don't do it put their business at risk. And I'm not overstating that. Just to wrap this up, I'll give you my story of GM. Because many people want to go back and reflect upon why an historic icon like GM went through what we went through. And you can point to pensions and labor negotiations and management kerfuffles and all those things going along with it. I spent almost 20 years of my life working with and working for that company. At its core, the number one problem that sunk GM was we lost customer centricity. It's at its core. This is a company that displaced Ford in the 1930s by being brand focused and customer focused. That was the brilliance of Alfred Sloan. The pure brilliance of Alfred Sloan was not the modern organizational structure. The brilliance of Alfred Sloan was the fact that he understood that it was customer first, and the strength of a brand to convey a message to a customer and deliver on that promise, displace Ford. That was his brilliance. And GM completely lost that. Now, don't get me wrong. We had data and research and analytics and capabilities that no company, including the US government, could match. I ran a survey that was as big as the United States Census. We suffered from two problems. We lost sight of the fact that the, it was all about the customer. And secondly, we lost sight of the fact that the capabilities we were building ultimately had to be ingested in a way where we would make a difference in our decisioning. That's my challenge to you. Are you sufficiently customer centric? Are you able today to leverage the potential that is available to you in a way where your day to day decisioning will allow you to deliver on that? Or are you customer centric in management speak, which is usually putting nice flowery words in your annual report or in your public declarations or other things? The world of the last 30 years has moved to a customer centered model. The world in the next 20 years is going to become even more customer centric. Data and analytics are enabling tools when properly harnessed. When they're not properly harnessed or embedded, they become an expense bucket. Our commitment to you is to help you not 
allow them to become an expense bucket. 